Hello S1 and welcome to your next lesson from the witchcraft topic which is focusing on witch trials. Now what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to look to investigate how witches were put on trial and punished in the 17th century and we're going to look to explore a Scottish case study in a bit more detail. So this lesson is focusing a bit more on what took place at witch trials. So again your jotters if you want to take the heading witch trials or if you're doing this on a word document you could take the heading witch trials. Now, if you think about the fact that you've identified a witch at this time and you've found your witch, what do you actually do with them? Well, that's where witch trials come in to play. Now, what can you see happening in this image? Well, as you can see here, there is a woman lying on the ground. You have people in a room and you have what appears to be judges of some sort at the top as well. Now, this is what a witch trial may look like. You have a woman on trial who's lying on the ground you have a woman very close to stand giving evidence and you have what appears to be a judge. Now, that isn't necessarily the judge that we know nowadays. That could be a respected member of the village. That could be a churchman. It could be an elderly member of the village who is seen to pass judgment over whether or not this woman is a witch or not. And you have obviously a crowd in the background there watching as well. Now, in 1604, James I and Parliament actually passed a law that allowed witches to be put on trial in court. So it was actually made into law. It was allowed to happen. And that is James I there. Now, after this law was passed, there were more witchcraft cases in the Essex courts than of any other crime apart from theft. So that shows you there how seriously witchcraft was taken. The only other crime that there was more trials for was theft. Apart from that, it was witchcraft. Now, hundreds of witches were put on trial and executed all over Britain, and most of them were actually hanged or burnt at the stake when they were actually killed. And again, we'll be looking at that in more detail later on. Now, how goes from the hunt to the trial? So now that the witch has been hunted from people like, as we remember from the last lesson, Matthew Hopkins, now the witch has been hunted and been found, it was time to prove that she was a witch. So this led to court cases against the accused witches. Now this is a very serious affair in the 17th century. Because it had been made into law by James I in Parliament, people were allowed to be put on trial for being witches. Now many were often tortured when they were on trial, which forced them to admit their crimes. Now many accused people would shout out the names of others they knew that were innocent people just because they wanted the torture to end. So you could be put on trial as a witch, you could be being tortured and you could just start shouting out names of people that you know, innocent people, but just because you want that torture to end, which also led to more people then being put on trial. Now, testing for guilt. Now, once witches were accused, they were tested in a variety of different ways. Now, some of these methods didn't even require a confession, as the test itself would actually decide the fate of the accused person. Now, can you think of any possible tests that in century people may have used to test for witchcraft? So try and list some of these in your jotter about some of the ways that they may have used to test people for being witches. You'll have a clue at the picture at the top there. And we're going to go over some of them in a moment. Now, testing a witch. Now, there's different types of tests that were carried out to see if a person was a witch or not. Now, what we'd like to do in your jotter, or again, if you're doing this on a word document, if you put testing a witch in the middle of your jotter, and around that, you're looking to write down these points here. So we have touch test, talking to yourself, prayer test, Bible weighing, the witch's mark, dunking, and ordeal by fire. Now what you're looking to do with this mind map of the different methods of testing a witch, you're looking to write down two facts per method. So we're going to go over each method in terms of how you test for a witch, and you're looking to write down two facts for each method. Now, let's start with dunking. Now, dunking in medieval times, until the early 18th century, dunking was seen as a way to establish whether or not a suspect was a witch. Now, this test was linked to baptism and water. Now, it was believed that water rejected servants of the devil. So, if a suspect floated or refused to sink, it was proof that they were guilty because the water was rejecting them because they were servants of the devil. So, if they float or they don't sink, then they're guilty. Now that's used to punish a number of different people in society for things like arguing or politically insulting someone and sometimes for women who had an illegitimate child or were in prostitution that was also used as well. Now 
this was ultimately a torture me method that was also used mainly on women. Now sometimes a chair was used or the suspect was tied to a rope and you can see from the pictures at the top here. Now obviously if you don't float or you don't stay above the water, if you actually sink then that is going to lead to a chance of you ultimately being killed if you're kept underwater for too long. Which well, did happen in a lot of cases so women would be in particular would be put underwater and let's say they weren't floating they were actually sinking and they were kept under for too long then sometimes they would end up dying. So our deal by water slash dunking. So you've got here a rope was looped around her waist. She was then lowered into the water three times. If she floated she was a witch. If she sh if she sank she was innocent. Just to be sure they often left the person underwater for quite a long time and sometimes it was too long and the person would sometimes end up drowning. So, if we're thinking about dunking, two facts that you could add for dunking there. We've got, if a suspect floated or refused to sink, it was proof of guilt. Sometimes a chair was used or the suspect was tied with rope. So there's two facts there that you could have for dunking. So that's what you're looking to do for each of these methods here for testing which You're just looking to add in two facts for each of them. Okay, next one is finding the witch's mark. Now, Peel believed that the devil put an invisible mark on a witch to symbolise obedience and that she could feel no pain on the mark. Now, hunters would sometimes strip suspects naked, then publicly examine them for marks, so look on their body to see if they had any marks. Now, once you found the supposed devil's mark, this was usually a mole, a birthmark or a wart, they would test if the suspect witch felt pain by using a large pin to poke the mark. So, if you had a mole or a birthmark or a wart that was found, then a pin would be pressed upon it to see if you felt any pain from that. Now, if the victim felt no pain and did not bleed, then she was seen to be a witch. Another way to test if someone was a witch or not was Bible weighing. Now, the suspect was weighed against a heavy Bible or a stack of Bibles. Now, if she weighed less, than the Bible or the Sack of Bibles, she was deemed as guilty. Now, some got off with this only if the skills match exactly. So if you read the same as the Bibles, then you would get off. But if you read less than the Bibles, then you could be found as guilty. Now, sometimes it would be a case where you might be standing on the scales, scales on you on one side, the Bibles on the other, and they'd keep adding Bibles on to see if there was a balance or to make sure that you weighed less than what was actually there. So, Bible weighing was one way. Another way to test if you were a witch was the prayer test. So, sorcerers were believed to be incapable of speaking scripture. So suspects had to recite passages, usually the Lord's Prayer, without a single error. Now any illiteracy or nerves were no defence and in 1712 Jane Wenham was hanged after missing the knot out of leads us not into temptation. So she said leads us, led us into temptation and because she missed out not one word she was then hanged as a result. Now at the Salem which was in America in 1692, one of the accused sorcerers, George Burroughs, who was obviously a man, so quite unusual at this time to be accused of being a witch. He recited that our father flawlessly didn't miss out one word, but he was still executed because the judge deemed that to be a trick that he was able to do it so flawlessly. So even if you did manage to say the prayer test properly, then ultimately you could still be sentenced to death. So another way of testing was to get suspected witches to try and say the Lord's Prayer without missing out any words and with saying it properly. Another way of testing for witches was talking to yourself. So during the Salem trials again, one Sarah Good was damned because she sometimes muttered to herself, often when leaving people's houses. Now she said she was reciting commandments, but accuser said that she was sometimes casting spells. So she was hanged on the July 19th, 1692. So if you were talking to yourself, that was a sign that you were a potential witch. The touch test was also another way. So if the accused witch touched the victim while the victim was having a fit, and then the fit stopped, and that meant that the accused person was the one who'd caused pain to the victim. So if someone was having a fit and you, the accused witch, touched them and they stopped having a fit, then that must have meant that you were giving them the fit in the first place, is what people believed, so you were obviously a witch. 
Another way to test was ordeal by fire. Now the suspect was required to walk a certain distance. Usually it was nine feet over red hot plowshares, which are effectively metal, or while holding a red hot iron. Now the suspect would then obviously have wounds. Now this could be on their hands or their feet, so these wounds would then be bandaged up and left for three days. After the three days had passed, a priest would then examine the wound. Now if the wound had healed completely, and there was no sign of it, then the priest would pronounce that God had intervened to heal it, so God had healed the wounds. However, if the wounds were still visible, the priest would declare it a sign of guilt, so that must mean they must be guilty. Now if you think even when you get a small scratch on your finger, on your hands or on your foot, then it usually takes longer than three days for it to clear up. These apparent witches were being asked to walk across burning hot metal. They would have wounds on their hands, they would have wounds on their feet, and ultimately, if these hadn't cleared up by three days, then they would be accused of being a witch. Now, this test was based on the belief that God would give the innocent the strength to bear the pain and then heal them very quickly, whilst the guilty would be left to rot. So, ultimately, if your wounds cleared, that was a sign of God's work because you were not a witch. Now, other more traditional torture methods were also used to get confessions and accusations against witches and accomplices. You had thumb screws, which you can see at the top there. So thumb screws were used to try and crush your thumbs and toes to get you to confess. You had whipping stocks with iron spikes. You had scald and lime baths. You had prayer stools, which were, which were furnished with sharp pegs. You had racks, which would mean you'd be stretched out on a rack, so your hands and feet would be tied at either end and you'd be stretched out. You also had the strapado, which was hoisting on a pulley to pull the arms from the socket, so your sockets would end up becoming disjointed to try and torture you into confessing to being a witch. Now, below is the testimony of a 16-year-old accused of witchcraft, and her name was Abigail Hobbs. This was taken on April 19th, 1692. Now, she was actually tortured for three days and then made this confession. Judge, Abigail Hobbs, you are brought before authority to answer to various acts of witchcraft. What say you? Are you guilty or not? Speak the truth. Abigail Hobbs says, I will speak the truth. I have seen sights and been scared. I have been very wicked. I hope I shall be better. If God will help me. Judge, what sights do you see? Abigail Hobbs, I have seen the devil. Judge, how often? Many times? Abigail Hobbs, but once. What would he have you do? Asked the judge. Abigail Hobbs replies, why? He would have me be a witch. Judge, would he have you make a convent with him? Abigail Hobbs, yes. Judge, you are guilty and we hanged at Dawn. Now, is this a fair confession if you knew that Abigail Hobbs had been tortured for three days before? Well, you would argue, no, it isn't a fair confession because Abigail Hobbs is maybe thinking if she confesses, the torture will stop. But ultimately, by confessing here, she is then being hung. Now, if we think about how fair were witch trials, a witness at a trial in Newcastle, which took place in 1649, said, He jabbed the pin into her thigh and held it there for a moment. There was a scream of pain but no blood. He asked her why she did not bleed. Ignoring her answer, he then he took out the pin and set her aside as a child of the devil. The puncture wept tears of blood afterwards. So again, this is people saying that at trials, again, women are being actually stabbed with instruments like pins, and then if they're not bleeding, are then being accused of being much as well. So they're actually being tortured du during trials. Again, if you think about this today in a modern court, why would this be unacceptable in a modern court today? Well, remember, we all have the right to a fair trial nowadays, unlike what was happening to these apparent witches. Now, the outcome of a witch trial. Now, there was some varying ways to execute accused witches if they were found guilty, which we discussed earlier on in the lesson. The most common was burning at the stake. So, burning the accused witch at the stake, burning them alive in the picture at the top there shows you that happening. Another common way to execute accused witches if they were found guilty was to hang them. And in modern Sweden in 1669, there's actually a famous case whereby the witches were actually decapitated, so their head was cut off, and then the body was then burnt at the stake. So they could also be beheaded and then burnt. So the three most common ways were burning at the stake, hanging, and then there were some cases where the head would be cut off and then the body was burnt. Now, think about what we've got in today's lesson. You've got a true or false summary here. So you need to write true or false for each of these statements. And for the false statements... If you think it's false, write the right answer next to it. So, the statements. Number one, witch, uh, witches were treated fairly and given fair trials. So, do you think that's true or do you think that's false? If you think it's true, 
put true beside it. If you think it's false, write false and then write the correct answer beside it. Dunking is when witches were dunked in water and if they floated they were innocent. Witches were trialled by fire, which meant they were forced to walk over hot metal or hold a red hot iron. If their wounds did not heal in three days, they were a witch. In 1604, James first passed a law that meant witches could now be trialled in court. Number five, the suspect was weighed against a heavy Bible or a stack of them. If a suspect weighed less than a Bible, she was innocent. Now the last part of this lesson, what you're looking to do is to describe a witch trial worth four marks. So remember, we've done the describe questions already, so you have to make four points using the correct structure. So you've got here, many events would take place at a witch trial. Firstly, secondly, thirdly, lastly. So you're looking to make four points here. So you could say, for example, firstly, witches could be asked to read the Lord's Prayer without seeing a mistake. Secondly, witches could be asked to walk over hot metal. So just try and give four points here on what would actually happen at witch trials. Okay, so for this lesson, what you're looking to upload via Teams, you're looking to upload your completed mind map on testing a witch. So different ways that witches could be tested. So you're looking to upload your completed mind map on that. Your true or false summary, so again you're writing the answers true or false beside those statements. Any ones that are false, you're looking to write what you think is the correct answer. And then the decide question there on a witch trial which is worth four marks. So you're looking to upload your answer to that as well. Again, if you're showing to upload your answer via Teams, via the assignment tab, if you just email your teacher. And again, if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you.